Hey, everyone. Okay, I have a couple of quick announcements. You don't want to miss these. I'm very excited about them, and I hope you will be as well. Through the months of September and October, I'm going to be doing bonus podcast episodes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. These episodes will be shorter in duration, just about 15 minutes than the typical show. So if you get, if you're someone who gets notifications, whenever a new episode of the Suzanne Banker show has been uploaded, you're now going to get three notifications instead of one. So I'll pop up on your phone a couple of times a week. And hopefully that's a good thing because the point is to um, not bug you, but to give you much needed inspiration. So that's one thing. And then also we'll see how that goes. And if that if that continues to go really well, we'll continue that beyond October. But for now, I've just committed to September and October, mostly to cover so much of the content in my new book, How to Get Hitched and Stay Hitched, because there's just way more in there than meets the eye just from the title. So that's part, part of the reason why I'm going to be doing this. Okay. Also, I will be speaking live. I know post-COVID, it's so amazing to get out into the world. I will be speaking live in Orlando, Florida on October 23rd at the 22 convention, which was founded by Anthony Johnson, an American entrepreneur whose mission is to abolish feminism and get this, make women great again. <laughs> Needless to say, that title um, perked my interest. And you'll, you'll see why when you take a look at, at, at what this is all about, why, why we're definitely a match. Let's put it that way. It is time to reject once and for all, the toxic feminist dogma that undermines your ability to love and understand men and to build strong families. I would love to meet and talk with any one of my readers or listeners or followers or clients in Orlando. And the best part is fans of Suzanne Venker get a 25% off discount by using the code VENK25. That's V-E-N-K-25. V-E-N-K-25 when you go to check out. This is again on October 23rd. Of course, the, um, the, the um, conference itself goes on longer than one day, but that's when I'll be speaking. My podcast producer, Kelsey, and I will be there selling books, chatting it up, and having an all-around blast. So we hope to see you all there. And yes, it will be this speaking, um, the speech, if you want to call it that, the talk, will be available later via the internet but there is nothing better than a live event. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm ready to get out in the world and chat with people and get out from behind my computer. And I hope you guys are too. So that website is 22, the number 22 convention.com 22 convention.com. Take a look through the whole thing. Um, there'll be more information coming up about this as we go along here about what I'm talking about. I'm just honed in on my talk, not, the, the convention itself. So, um, you, yeah, just, just know that when you go to sign up for it and you get to the end page, you put in that code V E N K V E N K 25 and you'll get 25% off. Okay. And now on with the show. From the magnificent Midwest, it's the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week when we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives about men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. Are you struggling to raise emotionally healthy, resilient adolescents in this fast-paced, ever-changing world? We have an epidemic of mental health disorders in adolescence today that makes parenting even more challenging but parents can still have an enormous impact on the health and well-being of their children. In her soon-to-be-released book, Chicken Little, The Sky Isn't Falling, which is currently available on Amazon for pre-order, Erica Komisar offers parents the tools they need to navigate this tumultuous time of change and create a continuous, deep connection with their children. Erica Komisar, many of you know, has been on this program several times. She is the guru, in my opinion, for everything parenting-related. You don't need anybody else in your life to help guide you if you have Erica. That's how strongly I feel about her. She's a psychoanalyst and parent guidance expert who has been in private practice in New York City for over 30 years. She's also the author of Being There, Why Prioritizing Motherhood in the First Three Years Matters. Erica is back with us today to discuss the topic of her new book, Chicken Little. Welcome back to the show, Erica. 
Thank you, Suzanne, for having me. Sure. I'm really, really, really excited to talk about this book you have coming up and this topic because it is so, so timely, crucial, and I know parents are going to benefit from it in a huge way. So I post, I'm going to begin by talking about how I posted on Facebook your a Wall Street Journal article you wrote called COVID Didn't Start the Mental Health Crisis, mm. which I believe encapsulates the message in your upcoming book, which I talked about at the opening called Chicken Little, The Sky Isn't Falling, mm -hmm. which we're going to talk about today. Um, and and I, one comment, well, there were several comments on the on the post, but one one gal named Leela wrote that, a lo quote, a lot of parents who are otherwise attentive seem to tune out when the teenage years hit and really have no idea what is going on in their teen's life. Mm -hmm. I want to know if that's an assessment that you agree with and see on your end. It is, and I think the reason being um, the misunderstanding that when their teenagers push them away, they no longer need them. Um, I think that's a common misunderstanding. You know, teenagers are supposed to push you away. It's part of the process of separation um, so they can become their own people, so they can become separate individuals, which is ultimately what you want for them to be mentally healthy. But in the process, um, they do push at you and they do push you away and they create space, but that is often misinterpreted as not needing you. And in fact, they need you greatly in this period of time. And that's why I wrote the book, to say that yeah. uh, you haven't just, um, you know, it, it's not over. You have a chance to really make a difference. And having just come out of this, I'm like, I'm about to be an empty nester in August, and I have an 18-year-old son who appeared to need me far less than my daughter, who's now 21. And I think it would be easy to assume that because his personality is so different, and he's a guy instead of a gal, and you know we were very, she and I you know had more in common being females um, to assume that that he was like you say not needing me, and I have had to sort of force my way into his life on a on a on a daily basis really. If I want a conversation, I have to. So I I strategically put a chair in his room um, so that when I walked in there, I had a place to sit rather than just standing there, mm -hmm. and just sort of was in his space or I am regularly in his space, which fosters conversation with him. And if I didn't, that was, that's just a small example of something that if I didn't do that, it would be harder um, to, to get him to um, start a conversation, I guess is the best way of putting it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, you have to read them, right? And it's, and it's, and don't assume that because they are seemingly so old <laughs> that they, that you're not needed. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so from this article that, that, I, that you wrote called COVID Didn't Start the Mental Health Crisis, I just want to read and tell people a little bit about what you were saying in there, which is really good with the book Chicken Little that you have coming out that we're going to talk about, mm -hmm. but I'm going to start there. So th you basically were arguing that, you know, you know there's a lot of, um, there's been a lot of um, attention on COVID and what happened during that year and it's still happening or whatever, and great, a great deal of attention is played, is Put on people's mental health as a result of that and your point in this argument in this uh, article correct me if i'm wrong was basically saying look this, this was long and coming way before COVID hit and COVID just sort of shown a spotlight on what's really happening mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um a couple things you wrote um COVID exacerbated a crisis that was already building the way to protect children's mental well-being in the long term is strong parental care from an early age and then you have a paragraph here talking about how adversity has always been around, right? Previous mm -hmm. generations faced poverty, unemployment, war, so on and so forth. Why is the current adversity causing so much mental distress? A major reason is that we have devalued the work of parents. Mothers and fathers are less present for their children physically and emotionally, starting in early childhood and throughout adolescence. And this diminishes a child's resilience and emotional fortitude throughout life resulting in more mental health problems in adolescence and adulthood. So down the line. So what you do in those early years matters. Why, um, why is this so hard, do you think, to kind of understand? Or are you finding that people are getting it when you're explaining it? Or like, what's the reaction to this? Because to me, 
it's very clear. But I think I really truly believe that a lot of people, especially in the younger generations, don't have any idea that what they're doing or what, what goes on in the, in the parenting years, not just the first three, as we focused on last time with your other book, but throughout those 18 years is so critical to our mental health specifically. Well, because I think the idea that parents are, I mean, clearly we're not completely responsible for how our children turn out. There is a small part of how our children turn out that is constitutional, genetic. There's another piece of it that's mm -hmm. about what happens to them in their environment, you know, the kinds of adversities they face along the way. Um, you know, so, so there are other factors, certainly. But I think to say that parents are um, primarily uh, responsible for the development of children's personalities and whether they develop resilience into those personalities um, and whether those children come out feeling emotionally secure, that places a lot of responsibility on parents. And even though you'd say, you know, you know duh, you know, parents are responsible, I think there's a real push in our society to really feel an individualistic push to say, you know, um, you know, a, as a parent, I should be able to do whatever I want. I should be able to pursue my own desires. You know, uh, I matter, you know, me, me, me. And although that's all true to a certain extent in my book, I say as a parent, you can't be a good enough parent to a, a young child or an adolescent unless you take care of yourself for sure. And unless you nurture your relationship with your spouse, right? So it's not that those things don't matter, but again, I say this to parents of younger children and older children, there's a tremendous amount of responsibility and sacrifice that's required if you're gonna raise children and care for them. And we're gonna come out on the other end of childhood. You know, I always say adolescence is an adversity, even in the healthiest of situations. Yes. Adolescence <laughs> is adversity. It starts about so, middle school, right? Yeah, so if they're gonna come out of that adversity whole, as people, you have to be around a lot, and not just physically, but you have to be there to process what happens to them and how they feel about what happens to them. And that is the primary role of parents, um, again, whether we're talking about young children or older children. And the reason why I've had you on, I don't know, three or four times now, and the reason why I point people toward you is because I don't really know of any other person who's in your line of work, I'm sure they exist, but who's also written and spoken out publicly and made this connection um, with beginning with daycare, the discussion of daycare and what that does. Um, and more specifically, as you wrote here in this piece, um, about prioritizing financial success and careers over the rearing of children, which of course is right in my wheelhouse. And um, I, that's why I, that's why I love you so much. <laughs> that's why I keep reading all your stuff every time it comes out and get in touch with you and all of that. So let me read this. Um, As a society, we have abandoned the care of children to institutional or group care. We have exposed them to early separation from parents' physical and emotional presence, and we have prioritized financial success and careers over children. We put less emphasis on caring for and being present for children while simultaneously, oh wait, I'm going to come back to that. Take that out, Kelsey. Don't, don't put that second sentence in because I want to say that afterward. Um, so that is, to me, there's no disconnecting that this has all happened because of our values as a society. There's just no question that the materialistic nature um, and the way and the changes that have occurred over the last several decades have had a direct effect on child rearing. And it's not an accident that children, older children are having the mental health problems that they're having as a result of this major switch in the way we rear children over the last 30 years. I don't know of anyone else who makes that connection but you. Mm. That's a sad statement, but it, it may be true. I, I think it's, um... I think because it, when, you, when you make that statement, it exposes you to a lot of criticism. You know, there's, um, you know. I know very well. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I think people avoid, they're conflict diverse mostly in my field. 
interestingly, right? Yeah. As therapists, we, uh, we deal with conflict every day in patients, but in terms of public controversy, I would say most therapists um, avoid it. So that's probably why you haven't heard as much more from clinicians like myself. What do you, what, why, why you? Well, I'm just curious about you and the impetus for your, your um, ability and choice to walk into that fire while your client, I mean, while your colleagues wouldn't. Well, from a professional perspective, I was practicing and feeling frustrated because I was, you know, constantly putting out fires with patients who were coming in, you know, with children who um, were, were starting to show earlier and earlier signs of disturbance. And that's why I wrote the first book. Uh, and I was connecting it to the absence of parents on a daily basis in those children's lives. And it's the same with adolescents. I mean, again, I think there are many reasons why parents may either tune out, check out, uh, misunderstand the needs of their teenagers. Um, but in any case, that, that drove me to want to really get involved in something that would help me to, you know, to help parents to prevent some of these issues. You know, the ADHD diagnosis, the behavioral problems, the increase in anxiety and depression in children and teenagers. And, and I really wanted to make a good effort to say, right, how can you prevent, because the best way to treat all these disorders in, in children and families is prevention. That's the best yep. way. Um, and if you can't, then of course there are ways. So in the book, I focus a lot on what you can do, which is why I say to parents, buy this book, um, even if your children aren't struggling with any of these things, because it's a book about not only addressing things when they happen, but preventing them before they happen. What can you do as a parent? It's so important. It's clear that a lot of these things, the, the, the probability is a lot of these things won't happen to you. Um, so, and then on a personal level, I suppose you could say, I got into this field and this kind of work uh, and interest in it because my own mother was incredibly um, loving, but had been traumatized in her own way as a child. Her own mother was orphaned at a very young age. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Her own mother. My was own what? mother was orf. My own mother's mother was orphaned at a very or young. Age. And my mother, who was very loving, struggled deeply to connect. Um, she was there physically, but she couldn't connect emotionally. It was very hard for her to deeply connect with her children. Um, and she would dissociate, which is, I think, what a lot of parents do. And that drove me to be the therapist that I am today, in a way, to help parents to connect with their children, because that's what's going to create the emotional security and the health in your adolescence. Okay. So that's, that's the missing piece there, that when you have that personal experience, it just drives you, right? Mm -hmm. In a big way, I think. It does. Um, and and because I, I I truly do believe that so much of this is about ignorance and lack of education about making that I truly think that people think that the early years, for example, are just feeding and diapering and anybody can do that and then maybe when they're older it's more important to be around kind of thing. Um, I, there is no connection being made about the emotion. In fact, you even hear people who are asked, you know, how did your children turn out? And they start talking about, well, this one has a PhD and this one's married with kids and this they just they give all these outward factors that are supposed to prove which something which they don't prove anything because you don't know about their emotional makeup or what's happening in their personal lives mm -hmm. so the markers for how well someone does is always um something tangible rather than what's going on in the head right and in the heart well it's achievement focused rather than emotionally sort of focusing on the emotional health of the person so yeah, it's, yeah. It, that is something that our society struggles with, how we define success and how we translate that to our children, how we, you know, how we define success to our children and what expectations they have of themselves based on the expectations we have of them. Which speaking of, so this is the second thing that you have here that I um, wanted to highlight because I, again feel so strongly about this and it's just to me it's it's the it's the piece of it you you wrote we have put less emphasis on caring for and being present for children while simultaneously expecting more from them 
academically, socially, and in all of their extracurricular interests. Mm -hmm. So you could basically say, we have all these expectations of you, but you're just kind of going to do it on your own. I'm going to go over here and do my thing, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and we give more to our children materially. Um, I, I mean, in, in a way, we try to compensate in our, in our society by giving to our children, you know, better houses, better cars, better schools, better clothes, better vacations, better stuff. Um, thinking that that's, you know, so we work hard so we can give them more stuff and a better material life. And although poverty has been shown to be associated with depression and mental illness, um, affluence has too. So there's a study about, um, out of Columbia University, a researcher did a study about how children from affluent families and children from impoverished families are struggling in the same way uh, in terms of their mental health. They're struggling in the same intensity and degree with their mental health. Uh, and the children who do the best are the children in the middle, not the ones who are uh, struggling in poverty, um, but also the ones whose parents are not so um, distracted. Um, and and not so sort of where the emphasis is not on how much you can give your children materially, but actually, you know, having a slightly boring job and getting home by five o'clock and going to your children's basketball games and eating dinner with them every night and playing baseball in the summer out in the field with them. And, you know, it's, it's the concept of time, right? right. Half families are as absent in many ways as impoverished families. Absolutely. And I think we talked about that once in a, in a previous conversation, but you yeah. definitely cannot overemphasize that. I think that's a, um, something people rarely hear at all or think about. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's, let's get into Chicken Little. So tell me, first of all, tell me about that title. Who came up with that? <laughs> well, it had to be catchy because there's a lot of books that are vying for the same market. So it had to be catchy, but I mean, when I was a little girl, that book really struck my attention, you know, um, because it's a book about hysteria. It's a book about anxiety. It's a book about fear. Um, and it's a book about, uh, you know, the, the book for children, Chicken Little, The Sky is Falling. Um, you know, so, and it's meant to be a book to, a, you read it to very young children, and you're meant to allay their fears by reading that book, by saying, see, it's not so bad. Um, so that's where the title came from. Um, you know, the idea that, that uh, you know, our children are running around really feeling, if they don't show it on the outside, they're certainly feeling it on the inside, a sense of uh, being overwhelmed with fear. And that's what anxiety is. It's basically, at its root, it's fear. It's fear, yeah. right. And of course, it manifests itself in so many different ways, right? Even though so it's under the umbrella of anxiety. That's right. It can manifest itself as aggression, it can manifest itself as attentional issues like ADHD, it can manifest itself uh, in truly anxiety terms, and it can manifest itself as depression. So yeah, it definitely- OCD, is. that's another big one, right? Keeping yes. yourself busy, busy, busy. Absolutely, these are all ways in which it can manifest. So let's, um, you go right, so this book, and I'll let you, explain it better, but um, you, the focus is adolescence, right? Whereas the first one was the first three years. So I'm going to start by reading a couple of things early at the beginning of the book, which is about the earlier years, but then you really get into the, the teenage years quickly because that's the focus. You write the push for early independence. I'm sorry, I'm going to say that again, Kelsey, delete that. You write, quote, the push for early <laughs> independence is backfiring. Yeah. leaving our kids less able to cope with the stress of a more complicated complicated and overwhelming environment. And that starts with detachment at a very early age, right? Not being there physically and emotionally then, but then as the kids get older, they have all these other things to contend with. And if you're not available, then we still have problems. And one of the things you point to is the internet and social media use and what a corrosive impact that has had um, teenagers' ability to to deal with frustrations. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I think there's confusion over what independence means because you do want your children to learn incrementally to be more independent or more interdependent, which means they have to develop some independence. Um, and I think we get it as parents confused. Um, we want our children to explore, to take a few risks, to do more things on their own, um, but we don't want to abandon them emotionally, particularly as they're taking more risks and trying more things and taking more social chances and um, their lives get more complicated. And that means you need to be there more emotionally to process what's happening to them. You know, and puberty itself, as I said, you know, adolescence is an adversity. Puberty is really, uh, can be very traumatic for a mm -hmm. lot of kids. Mm -hmm. You know, their bodies are changing um, disproportionately. You and know, this is true even before the internet and social even media. Even before the internet and social media. So, you know, the idea that we leave them alone to try new things is not a terrible, or we encourage them to, to do things on their own, is not a terrible, in fact, it's very important for, for healthy separation, but that we don't abandon them emotionally so we continue to help process them. So for instance, social media is a very overwhelming media. And you know to say that you can't cut them off from it, I mean, it would be very hard in in anywhere in the world at this point. You have to go to some far corner of the world to get away from it. So children are gonna have access to it. You don't wanna give them access to it too young, but when you do give them access to it, you have to be there to help process what happens on it and to teach them the etiquette of it and to teach them the rules and you know, to check in with them occasionally and even tell them that you're gonna check their social media account, not obsessively, but once in a while, just to make sure it's all healthy. You know, there's a way in which we, we do get this idea that teenagers don't need us and therefore they can be just on their own and, and, and it's just not true. They actually do need us for guidance. They need us for the emotional sort of processing that I'm talking about. Um, and that should not get confused with hovering or um, helicopter parenting, which is you don't let yes. them do anything on their own. We want to encourage them to do things on their own, but we also have to be there if we're going to do that. We have to be there to process it with them. And you, you wrote that, um, this is really interesting, that video games and tech addiction, that contrary to what most people think, these are actually symptoms of depression and anxiety rather than the root problem. Because a lot of people say, see, video games, they're causing my kid to be this way and that way. Well, any addiction is not caused, I mean, you know, you can't blame food for an eating disorder. Uh, you can't right. blame the video games for video addiction. Um, you can't blame the drugs, although I think a lot of people try to blame the drugs and the drugs are to blame. Um, and, you know, of course, you know, drugs, uh, particularly addictive drugs or video games are also addictive. They're addictive to an adolescent's brain. Um, you know, sugar could be addictive. But it's really, if you introduce any of those things to a healthier child with a good foundation who is emotionally secure and has parents that are very emotionally present for them, um, it's not going to have the same impact. So that's why I wrote that article. You know, so it's an adversity. You know, you could call these things in, in a way, you could call the intense um, sort of stimulation that comes out of the video addiction or the social media or the technology, you could call it an adversity. In a funny way, it is a kind of pleasure that's also an adversity. And to be able to cope with that, children need that process a lot. They need parents around to talk to them about their feelings because you develop addictions because addictions replace connection. It's like the substitute for connection. Um, and anytime you do too much of one thing as an adolescent, it sort of burns pathways in a very fragile developing brain. So, you know, I talk, as you know, in the book about adolescence being the second critical window of brain development, which is why a lot of addictions are happening then, because it's very it's more common to have those pathways, um, those obsessive pathways burned into one's brain in adolescence. 
Um, and so you have to be very present to make sure that that doesn't happen, or if it does seem to be starting to happen, to get them back on track. So just moving away from the media, uh, from media and social, well, from social media, I guess, um, for a moment, um, you wrote something else that's very interesting, and, and again, very important, and that's the idea <laughs> of a, an adolescence, a parent independence, speaking of independence and the difference between, you know, good and bad independence. Mm -hmm. um, you wrote, their seeming independence is a, def is a defense, a kind of emotional callus that allows them to cope with societies and their parents' expectations. Mm -hmm. So that's, you're speaking to a specific type, um, I believe, of, of independence where they were really not, as you say, um, attended to emotionally and they were encouraged to grow up too fast, uh, you know, and on their own or whatever. And so they appear to be, uh, I don't know, older than they are or what have you, um, mm -hmm. when in fact, it's just a defense. Yeah, it's, uh, it's called, I call it defense of independence, you know, instead of organically having developed independence, um, based on, um, I, you know, you can see it in toddlers, and then you can see it again in adolescence, um, which is what Margaret Mahler called emotional refueling, where your little ones will toddle off and explore the world and seem not to need you, but then they'll look back at you and check with you. It's like emotional checking to make sure you're there, or they'll toddle back to you and touch base and get a hug and get a kiss and then toddle off again. It's like refueling the, mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like plugging in the electric car, I guess would be the sustainability analogy of the day. Um, they come to get plugged in and to feel secure and then they go off again. Guess what? Adolescents do that too. And if you're there enough physically and emotionally, they do that throughout childhood leading up to adolescence. Um, and so, you know, they might be able to, the, the electric car may be able to go a little farther each time, but it still needs to come back and check with you. If you're not there, they develop um, compensatory adaptive ways, um, which are not necessarily healthy ways. They develop ways to um, you know, function without knowing that there's no one to, go, to come back to. And that, that really develops a very, what I call a hard shell in a very vulnerable interior. And those children are more susceptible to collapse. Those children are not the resilient children. And it's so important to be able to recognize it, right? Because there's a difference, you know, because two independent people mm -hmm. might seem similar, but they could be extraordinarily different, right? Well, you know, it's what parents of very young children will say to me, isn't it great? I took my child to school for the first time and they didn't look back. Oh. I'm talking like a three-year-old. And I say, <laughs> actually, no. <laughs> it could, in fact, be a sign of an attachment disorder. Your child is not only supposed to look back, it should be quite upset that you're leaving them there. Oh. So, you know, I think, again, the confusion over and, and idolizing, I mean, it's not even idealizing, it's creating an idol out of independence, mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. of self-sufficiency. And that really is doing our children in, you know, Do again, you know yeah. So, and I don't want this to be misinterpreted so people think I'm saying you should be a helicopter. Parent. Yeah, no, I totally get it. I, I know exactly what you're saying. I've had this conversation many times with people. It's just such a big difference, but I think you're right. People really don't, it has to be spelled out, really. If you haven't studied this or experienced it, it's just kind of hard to, you know, if it's not commonly known, it really does have to be explained. Yeah, and I, I'm gonna say that, that teenagers get into a lot of trouble because their brains are wired in such a way, as I said, there's so much development going on. Their brains are wired in such a way that um, the risk taking and reward centers of the brain are um, zooming ahead in development while the emotional regulation parts of the brain are lagging behind in development. So what that means is um, things that are novelty things, things that are exciting, things that give them pleasure, um, they can be taken too far because the other part of the brain that regulates emotions isn't, isn't up and running like it should be. And so they're very vulnerable, I would say. Um, and you know, 
I would say the more present you are to process what happens to them, because stuff is going to happen to them in adolescence. You cannot protect your adolescent from bad things happening. You cannot protect them from every bit of pain and frustration. But it is your responsibility as a parent to help them to process that pain and, and, and frustration. And another example of uh, <coughs> helping them can be, and it's something that's overlooked, I think, you have a whole section in there on um, how too many choices, and I've written about this, not with respect to parenting, but just in general, um, too many choices create anxiety and you're, you feel overwhelmed. And so you said, quote, it's not empowering, it's paralyzing. Yeah. And then I love the example of how this comes to be, you, I'm going to read this paragraph you wrote about how this um, how we parent in such a way that um, gives a false sense of um, empowerment, I guess, to, to young people when they tell them they can do and be anything they want, which is another, another thing that I've talked about. You wrote, children three to eight years of age dream of becoming a ballerina, a fireman, the president of the United States, a baseball hero. Eventually, their personal strengths and limitations begin to limit their choices. They love baseball, but may not be the best at it or they wanna be a ballerina, but they may not have the body or aptitude. This acceptance of their strengths and limitations is part of maturing into adulthood. But messages from parents in society that you can do anything and be whatever you want to our kids is a great disservice. It encourages narcissism and entitlement. Whenever we make a choice, we give up other choices. This is a loss. However, this also deepens the experience of the thing to which we commit. Mm -hmm. Love that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It also contributes to depression because when you contribute to narcissism, you contribute to depression because if you can't live up to an ideal that your parents have set for you or you've set for you, you can't reach that ideal, then you collapse, right? So it also leads to depression. And it's, I mean, I see it I see it so much in the younger generation and it's so painful because I, I, for the long time, I tried to figure out like what makes one parent do this and another not. And you probably have an opinion about that, but just from what I can see, it's, I feel like it's always whatever, whatever disappointments the parent had in his or her own life gets passed on and sort of, you know, like right onto the kid to say, here's whatever you, you know, you can do some, you can do this or you should do this, but it's never couched. The, the conversation's never finished with, with the why you're saying that, you know, what, what's, what's causing you to say that because you don't, you can't really believe that somebody can do and be anything they want, which is, which sounds like you're today sounds like you're saying something negative because it's so commonplace to say that it's like a thing you're supposed to say, but you're actually hurting them by saying that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, our role as parents as you said, is to, um, to help our children to, to sort of help them with their identity over time, right? So you'd say if, we're, if children are a block of clay, over time, their strengths and limitations, mostly their limitations, it's like carving a block of clay, right? So your child isn't going to be seven feet tall and maybe isn't going to be a professional basketball player. Okay, there's a, a big chunk of that play, play that goes away. You know, so my child, you know, may not be a math whiz and they're not going to be a rocket scientist and that goes away. You know, I, I think it's as much what you help children to take off the plate. Yes. As, as much as what you put on. Oh my God. One to define themselves. And so you know, your role is to help expose them to as much as, as you can so they can have some choices over time and start to eliminate things. Um, by process of elimination, one's personality is born. I love that. That's really good. Process mm -hmm. of elimination. You just do not hear that at all. And um, that's, that's a really big deal. It's, mm -hmm. you know, at first, you know, people who are, aren't used to, to hearing that will sort of bark back, then, it, then I'm limiting my child, you know? We but, hope you are, but that's, you know, as human beings, we all need boundaries and limitations. Yes. Yeah. The basis of mental health is that we all need boundaries and limitations. And, and uh, you know, as individuals, 
what helps us to be, you know, to feel good about ourselves is not just to know what we're good at, but to also be defined by what we're not good at. Um, so that, that is shapes who we are. Um, so one of the things that you, you didn't mention this once, you, you kind of have a theme on this, uh, that, that spoke to me a lot about, well, I, so I have a book coming out in August. I don't want to talk about it. We're here to talk about you, but I, I can't help but mention that because this, 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 this is a bigger issue, um, that you've written here, um, when it comes to to this mental health crisis. And that is that, quote, the values media promotes, whether social media or whatever, fame and fortune, rather than deep and meaningful human connections, has driven teens who are already conflicted and confused toward empty and ultimately dissatisfying goals and outcomes, end quote. So one of the things I'm gonna be talking about the rest of this year, once the book comes out, my book comes out, is, is that basically that very thing, that that focus on quote unquote fame and fortune rather than our relationships at home and making those connections to me from my end for all the research I do and all the coaching I do that is literally that has literally destroyed a generation of women yeah. and I hone in on the women here because they're really the ones who get this message more than anybody else mm -hmm. or more than men I should say um, which it negatively ends up affecting men by default but the focus is really for for women and on achieving and on being and on accumulating and on studying and on just pushing off marriage and family as long as possible, as though it's sort of an afterthought. And that, wow, 10 years in, their whole priorities have shifted and their mindset has changed and they are lacking that, those connections. And then they go out and search for them and they struggle at that point in their life. Mm -hmm. Very many of them. Yeah, that's well said. So I'm, I'm, I was just happy to see you, you know, hone in on that, that that's really important mm -hmm. and most importantly despite all of this um despite the message in your book at the at the end correct me if i'm wrong your message is really hey parents you are you still matter like despite everything that's going on around you and i know it sometimes feels to parents like and myself included like how do i not so much the parenting because i'm almost done with that but so to speak but i i'm so overwhelmed by what's happening in the world today and i know i'm not alone in that that you almost feel i don't know what the word is like i don't want to say give up but you feel like you just don't have the effect that you'd like to have if you still have children at home and your message certainly mine is that is so not true mm -hmm. and you specifically said in here parents can be most effective in supporting their children especially when they're still living at home this is usually from middle school through college but a parent still has influence when a young adult is out on their own. Also important, let's talk about that because I don't think anybody, I don't know that people believe that. <laughs> mm. I believe it. <laughs> well, it's, it de it's definitely diminishing returns. I mean, when your children move out of the house and live on their own, um, you know, when they're in college, you know, college is only six months of the year. And, uh, and so, kids are often home the other six months. I mean, I don't know whether it's changed since I went to college, but it seems like an awful short period of time. But yeah, you're paying a lot of money and it's really just about six or seven months. So they go back and forth while they're still in college. Mm -hmm. And once they're independent living, I mean, when they have their own places or they live with other people, it does become harder. Um, you know, you have geography that makes it hard and you have um, emotional distance that they may create, you know. So, you know, this is why I encourage parents, uh, you know, as much as possible, you know, your influence is greatest when your children are little and when they're home and when they're in the middle and high school years. Uh, and then it becomes diminishing returns through college and young adulthood, but you still have influence, meaning you can still try. We say the brain, the brain is a plastic organ, it grows and it shrinks. And so some of the same, you know, continuing to grow as a parent, learning to listen to your children, learning to be a better communicator, um, learning not to judge them, but to really kind of take in and, you know, be there for them without controlling the outcome. 
uh, or giving advice. And so that you can still do well into, you know, young adulthood and still have an influence on them. You have uh, one out and two at home, is that right, still? Uh, I have two out and uh, one at home. So my youngest is going to her senior year of high school next year. So she's the last year um, I have a, a college student and a graduate from college. So. Got it. Well, thank you as always, Erica. Really appreciate it. Tell people about your book, when it's coming, where they can find out about it and all that good stuff. So Chicken Little, The Sky Isn't Falling is coming out on October 5th. It's in pre-sales now and you can purchase it online at Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any of the online bookstores. Um, and you can also purchase it on my website, which is www.comisar.com. Excellent. So um, good luck with all that. I look forward to you see the, Sam. seeing you talk about it, hearing you talk about it. And I look forward to your book coming out as well. Thanks, Erica. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Venker Show. Before you leave us, I'd appreciate it if you'd take one minute to give us a review at Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you use. If you've done that already, or if you can't leave a review on your podcast player for some reason, please consider sharing the show with a friend or a family member. Word of mouth is the primary way we get the word out about the Suzanne Venker Show. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week. Thank you.